The year was 1799. This new country, this America, was just beginning to expand, to push outward, reaching north and south and westward toward the Great Plains, toward lands that held the promise of a new life, where men and women could live and work for themselves, free of government tyranny. Westward, across the great river, lay the hills and valleys and woodlands of a part of this new country that would become known as Missouri. It was here in this wilderness that a great American began the last part of his legendary life. It was here, to the Femo Sage country, that Daniel Boone moved with his family at the turn of the 19th century. Nathan Boone, son of Daniel. I recollect that trip with father and the rest of our family. We left our home in Kentucky and traveled westward, crossing mountains, valleys, and fording rivers sometimes swollen by rains. It was a hard trip to make. There were no roads and nowhere to restock our supplies. We brought what we could pack, and the rest we got the best way we could. This new country was full of game, and since father was a great hunter, we always had plenty to eat. I'll never forget the look on father's face when he finally looked out over the valley that was to become our home. By the time Daniel Boone reached the Osage Valley, he was already a legend. A fearless trailblazer, trusted scout, expert woodsman, loyal friend, and noble foe. Daniel Boone was the living spirit of this new nation. Our first job was to clear the land and build a log cabin for the family to live in. Then we began building our permanent home here in the Osage Valley. It was built out of stone that we quarried from giant limestone outcroppings here in the valley. The stones had to be cut, shaped, and fitted by hand. Although father was 69 years old when we began building, he hand carved all the woodwork for the mantles over the fireplaces that were used for heat and cooking. We built gun ports into the walls because at the time there was occasional trouble with the Indians and if trouble started, the house would be our fort against attack. We started building the home in 1803, and it took us seven years to finish. But we knew that when we were finished, the house would stand for a long time. Daniel Boone's first love was the solitary beauty of the wilderness. He was a born hunter. As a young man, he became an expert. He learned the habits of the game he hunted, and grew to know the land just as well. It was said that he never forgot a place that he had hunted or traveled over. Hunting was good here in Missouri. In fact, father said it reminded him of his younger days hunting in Kentucky before that land was settled. Hunting seemed to lift father's spirits and actually improve his health. He often told me about the long hunts he had been on. They were dangerous and would take up to several months, usually in the fall and winter seasons. When I was about 13, he taught me how to hunt. On one of our first trips, we had a close call. We were camped by a river. Father knew something was wrong, so he told me to be quiet and do as he said. I didn't see or hear anything, but I knew better than to argue with Father when it came to trouble in the wilderness. He was right. There was danger. As we got in the canoe and slipped into the river, I could see and hear the Indians back where our camp had been just a few moments ago. It was at that time... I first began to understand what my father had faced in his many years on the hunt. The never-ending danger of Indian attack. Oh, oh. Daniel Boone understood the Indians and their way of life. He respected them as expert hunters and as fierce warriors. Although Daniel later participated in many conflicts with the Indians, his first major experience with them was during the French and Indian War of 1775 near the Monongahela River. with the local militia that was fighting with the British. Daniel had warned the British there were French nearby, but the general ignored his advice and took his troops into the woods as if on parade. Daniel knew the danger, but he was helpless to prevent what lay ahead.
The French, with their scouts and Indian allies, moved into position and waited to spring the trap. Daniel was acting as wagon master. He was not near the front body of troops when they walked into the ambush. The Indian scouts knew of Daniel's warning and that the British general had ignored his advice. When they spotted the French, they fled, leaving the British to fight without them. The outcome was sealed before the first shot was fired. All that was left to do was the dying. When the bloody battle was over, most of the British force, over 1,500 men, lay where they had fallen. Those who were not dead soon would be. Daniel was one of the lucky ones. Although dazed, he managed to escape from the trap. As he left the battlefield, he encountered one of the French Indian scouts on a high gorge. The Indian raised his knife and boasted that he would kill one more of the enemy. <coughs> Daniel later said it was one of the very few Indians he was certain he had killed, and he said he regretted every one. Daniel was not a warrior by nature, and he was certainly no Indian hater. But the inevitable cost of life in the wilderness, with its battles against the Indians and the French, was high. In the year of 1773, Daniel lost his oldest son in an Indian attack in Kentucky. And in 82, he lost another son near the Blue Lick Mountains. He also lost a brother to the Indians. It was the way of life in the frontier wilderness. <laughs> 